Professor Niva Elkin Cohen. She is the Dean of the Faculty of Law from Haifa University. Niva, can you take? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to open this uh, afternoon's session finally, after it has been postponed for a few minutes. And uh, I was really looking forward to uh, moderating this uh, pa panel that deals with my favorite uh, subject, that is uh, copyright. I'm afraid I'm losing my voice, so I uh, was trying to keep my voice for this panel, but uh, I'll try uh, to be brief, and hopefully it will last until the Q&A session. Um, this uh, community of uh, um, Wikimedia activists and, and open access did a great job in exposing uh, some of the impediments created by copyright law uh, on access to knowledge and collaborative work. And uh, in fact, I believe that in this forum, we, many of us share uh, the belief that copyright law uh, indeed create these impediments and has uh, to be reformed. We failed, however, uh, to convey this message in other forums and to move copyright agenda uh, as a legislator and especially in international forums such as uh, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and WTO, and to help these organizations and legislators around the world to focus uh, not uh, only on copyright enforcement and uh, more rights, longer terms for copyright, but also on the real needs and interests of um, creators in the, in, in the digital environment. We have with us four speakers today uh, that, uh, based on their abstracts, I could say that are going to give excellent presentations on uh, some of the impediments created by copyright law, but also uh, looking at uh, some reform initiatives and some solutions for the problem created by copyright law. But in fact, if we want to change the agenda for uh, legislators and for uh, negotiators in international organizations, uh, what we really need uh, to do is to move away from these particular initiatives uh, and uh, from fighting and, uh, or initiating campaigns for particular exemptions uh, to copyright law and try to put these efforts uh, that are made on exempting orph orphan works, on expanding fair use, on uh, uh, allowing some, um, on, on shortening copyright law in some uh, cases, to try to put all of these initiatives within uh, a single framework that aims at redefining copyright law. That is something that we dealt with in the beginning of the 90s and for some reason has been abandoned uh, over the past 20 years and maybe should be put back into uh, on the agenda uh, for reform uh, uh, in this decade. So if we look at uh, Wikipedia, for example, it uh, really provides a working example of uh, uh, that of uh, online uh, activism that undermines some of the rationales for copyright law that um, creative works are not merely, are not created solely by uh, content industry, but also by individual users, and not simply by individual users, but by users working together in a collaborative manner, and, um, and that uh, these users may work together um, sometimes, uh, for non-profit uh, purposes, even though some of them may also want to generate profits from user-generated content in other contexts. So if uh, we look at copyright law from this perspective, only from the example of uh, using Wikipedia, 
we can sense that uh, copyright law is no longer a useful mechanism uh, for addressing the rights of individual users, that even those who want to get some remunerations for, um, for their creative uh, materials, even those who want to charge uh, for some use uh, of their work cannot uh, deal effectively with uh, the licensing and negotiation that is required by the current copyright regime that uh, would uh, force authors to license their work and negotiate the terms of the works. Of course, Creative Commons would provide some uh, a partial solution to that, but that would be a second best. We can think of mechanisms that are legislated into our law that would provide some uh, right to a share from any commercial use, for instance. Or if we look at collaborative use, uh, we can think of um, some mechanisms that would enable communities, such as Wikipedia, to uh, form themselves and address the rights of collaborators, not vis-a-vis -vis the general public, but among themselves. In what cases people can opt out of the community? What rights do they have? Uh, against the community in some cases? How do we secure some of the liberties of individual users within the community? And how do we secure the interests of the community of collaborators? All these issues are not dealt with within uh, a licensing regime and, and, uh, and contracts. And some of the collaborative communities find it difficult to migrate from one contractual uh, regime to another, which is something uh, that, of course, um, Wikipedians did successfully, but in other cases, um, uh, we see uh, migration of that sort that is failing. So if we want to shift the copyright debate from uh, the balanced discourse between the rights of authors and the rights of users, we must be able to articulate, articulate an alternative agenda. And I would suggest to you that some of the um, presentations that we'll hear today should be framed within a general framework of um, users' rights. We need to be able to articulate all of these exemptions and issues and uh, legal reforms within a more general framework of a bill of users' rights. And, and so this would not be about retaining the balance of copyright between authors and users. It would be about uh, focus, focusing on users as creators, which require some legal space to work with pre-existing materials. And from that perspective, users, and not merely right holders in the traditional sense, should be views, viewed as participants who are promoting the goal of copyright law that is uh, to promote um, creativity. Users' rights, of course, could also be articulated within the framework of um, other regime or other legal regimes that are external to copyright law, such as human rights and consumer protection laws. And we start to see some of these approaches that are limiting copyright and provide more space for users um, actually in the European uh, regime and most recently with respect to consumer rights in the um, European uh, directive um, related to consumers of uh, digital content. The, um, if we think of articulating users' rights, we need to uh, be able to articulate the rights of digital consumers, the, the users of music files, the users of electronic books. Uh, we need to be able to articulate the right, uh, right of access uh, for educational purposes, but also a right of access to personal use and a right to read in private. We need to redefine the scope of permissible transformative use. That is something that is not uh, proper, properly uh, defined by uh, current copyright regime. 
um, and, and a lot more uh, rights that could be listed under this bill of users' rights. Now, what can we benefit from it? We can, if we, if we are able to articulate uh, users' rights, we can set limits on enforcement of copyright by, by right holders in violation of these users' rights, and not just in violation of free speech or privacy, rights that are listed by other laws. We can also set limits on um, enforcement of rights by online service providers, and as a lot of user-generated content is facilitated by providers such as uh, search engines, uh, the Google, the YouTube, the social media platforms, the um, social networks. Um, what we, we, we need to uh, do is to be able to limit some of the licenses and some of the technological measures that are being used by these platforms in order to secure um, users' rights or user pri privileges. And once we are able to articulate a bill of users' rights, we can effectively limit um, you know, some of these arrangements in licenses and uh, in TPMs or DRMs. With this in mind, let me uh, turn it over to uh, our speakers today. And uh, since, surprisingly, we don't sit in a panel, I will just introduce them all up front instead of coming back and forth. And um, so we have our, our first speaker would be uh, Chris Cooper. Uh, from the UK, who we talked to us about uh, freedom of panorama and Wikimedia Commons. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jonathan uh, Klinger from uh, Israel, that will talk to us about culture for cultural for use, political narrative, and copyright. Uh, we'll hear from Nicholas uh, Baker from the University of Potsdam in Germany about uh, fighting the intellectual property regime. And uh, we'll close this session by a presentation uh, from uh, Ryan Kaldari from uh, Wikimedia in the US that will talk to us about Wikimedia and the public domain. Chris. Good afternoon. Um, today, as you already know, I'm going to be talking to you about Freedom Panorama and Wikimedia Commons. Now, I'm going to ask what is potentially a, perhaps a very obvious question to most of you. What is Wikimedia Commons? To answer that question, I'm going to look straight back at the project scope. Now, Wikimedia Commons is a media file repository making available public domain and freely licensed educational media content available to all. The two words I want to focus on there are public domain and, free, and freely licensed. A public domain simply means not copyrighted at all, or a free license is more complicated. Now, what does free license mean? Now, it's important to note there is a fixed definition of free license used by the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, in order to be free, a media such as a book must allow anyone to use and redistribute the media, including commercially, that's very important, in other words, for profit. It also allow them to create derivative works, in other words, I could take the book, alter it, and redistribute it myself. However, the copyright holder can still demand. That, um, that I give attribution when I take their book, and also to share alike. In other words, keep it under the same license. I can't just say, oh, well, it's my book work now, it's fully copyrighted. Uh, bear in mind, and this is often forgotten, that this definition does not mention individual countries. It's just a general definition of what's free. There's no saying, oh, it's got to be free in the US and so on. Um, now, everything that undermines, undermines this presentation is, um, is arch architectural and artistic copyright law which is simply a copyright of buildings, sculptures, artwork, and that kind of thing. Now, its main origins are in the Berne Convention, which is an international treaty signed by about 160 countries, uh, which is near universal. There are a few countries that haven't signed it. Um, it simply states that architecture and artwork is copyrighted in all forms, and which means that images featuring architecture or, architecture or artwork are derivative works of, the, of those copyrighted items. And this prevents such images being released under a free license, and this is where the trouble really starts. However, there are exemptions to architectural artistic copyright law, which there are four main ones. 
The first is what this presentation is named after, Freedom of Panorama, which is the main exception. The second is expiry of copyrights. The third is not meeting the threshold of originality. And the fourth is trivial inclusion or de minimis. Uh, there is a fifth exemption known as fair use, which we'll talk a bit more about later. However, that's not allowed on Commons, so that has, um, I'm deliberately ignoring it. However, it is allowed on the English Wikipedia and some other projects. Now, the first exemption, Freedom Panorama, often abbreviated as FOP, originates from the German term Panorama Freiheit. And that's the concept in German copyright law, which states that depictions of buildings or sculptures, such as um, paintings, photographs, are not a copyright violation, as long as what you're depicting is permanently located in a public place. For example, this photograph, picture of a building in a pu public place, it's still within copyright, however, it's not a copyright violation because it is permanently located in a public place and is subject to freedom and panorama. Um, something that is n quite noticeable in discussions is that people often forget this is a positive exception to copyright law. Uh, the term is often misunder misunderstood and misused. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, this violates freedom of panorama. Uh, there's a pan of freedom of panorama restrictions in this country. That's rubbish. Freedom of panorama exists or it doesn't. Um, uh, freedom of panorama does not just exist in Germany. It also exists in many other countries. To give some examples, um, in Israel, to give a good, that's a good one to use, um, architecture and sculptures and applied art subject to freedom of panorama. Uh, in the United States... Uh, it's a bit more restrictive, only buildings, so no artwork, no sculptures. Uh, the United Kingdom, I'm a bit biased because I'm from the UK, has one of the best freedom of panorama revisions. However, it still does not cover uh, 2D works such as paintings, etc. Uh, freedom of panorama uh, can exist in a few countries, but it is too limited to be useful. Uh, the big one is the former Soviet Union, where generally it's non-commercial use only, and as I said, everything on Commons has got to be available for commercial use, so that's no good. Uh, there are exceptions to this former Soviet Union, though. So for example, Poland does have freedom of panorama. Uh, Greece, another odd one. Uh, it's allows, the copyright law allows occasional reproduction by mass media, though nobody really knows what that means, and it's, um, <laughs> and it's no good for commons. Um, in Iceland, Arab Emirates is even more restrictive and says only broadcast, which, again, is no good for commons. Uh, there are a few countries that have no FOP at all. Uh, a classic example is France. Italy is the same. And also, to give an un-European example, it, is Qatar, though there are others as well, unfortunately. Um, exception two is expiry of copyright. Um, now, it sounds rather obvious. Authors' rights over the work eventually expire, um, and works with expired copyright are in the public domain. For example, this building is in the, clearly in the public domain because it was built hundreds of years ago, and nobody's going to come along and say, oh, well, this is my copyrighted work, although, amazingly, this has images of this building have been subject to copyright violation reports in Wikimedia Commons. Um, countries are free to set their own terms when copyright expires. However, they are subject to required minimums in some cases. For instance, those that sign a Berne Convention must give a term of life for the author, then a 50-year countdown. The European Union, however, came along and said to its members, well, this is not enough, so we're going to say a minimum of life plus 70 years. For reference, Israel is also life plus 70 years. Um, to make things even more complicated, however, so there are frequently different terms for anonymous works, sometimes to count down after publication or creation rather than life of the author because it doesn't work. There's also sometimes substantially lower terms for photog photography for some reason. Uh, in the United States, it is very, very complicated. I'm not going to get into that due to lack of time, though it is all over the place depending on when the work was published. Uh, the third exemption is not meeting the threshold of originality. Uh, in order to be copyrighted, something must be original enough. For example, a simple table would not be copyrighted. Um, this is frequently applied in court cases to logos. However, it can also be applied to architecture and artwork, at least in theory. Uh, there's a great deal of variation in countries to where the threshold is. Uh, the United States is generally looked at as having a low threshold in threshold originality, while Germany, again, has a high threshold. Uh, for example, the this Boeing logo is just text. In the United States, it's, that's not considered original enough to be copyrighted. However, in Germany, they decided that this logo, even with a picture in it, is still not original enough to be copyrighted. The fourth exception is, uh, is de minimis, which is a Latin expression for about minimal things, though it's short for a term the law does not concern itself with trivialities. So it's a, in copyright, that means it's a legal concept that allows trivial copying of, of copyrighted material to be simply ignored. 
Um, it's sometimes mentioned in statutory law, in other words, legislation, uh, such as in Germany, Israel, and the UK. Um, usually, this, this, uh, this law talks about uh, incidental inclusion and says that that's exempt. Uh, in some cases, however, it's entirely case law. In other words, judges have just decided that uh, this is something we need to keep sanity. Um, for example, in the US. Interestingly, on commons, it's noticeable that it's always presumed that de, minim de minimis exists, regardless of whether it's, whether it's known in case law or legislation in every country. Again, probably just to keep sanity. Uh, here's a good example of de minimis. This is from the United Arab Emirates in Dubai. Uh, very nice place to visit. They got me into trouble with Al Al. Um, um, this is a good example of de minimis because uh, this is a photo of a boat. However, there are buildings in the background, which is rather difficult to avoid as a city. However, they would be de minimis because they're not the subject of the photo and their inclusion is incidental. Um, now, I think it's worth covering what the uh, Wikimedia Foundation is required to uh, do legally. Now, its main server farm, though there are backup servers in other countries, is in Tampa, Florida, US, uh, which means it has to observe the laws of the United States, obviously. So there's no legal need to follow the copyright laws of other countries, which raises the question, why am I talking about the copyright laws of other countries? Well, on the English Wikipedia, that's exactly how it works. It's just United States is all that matters according to the non-US copyright policy. No need to worry about other countries at all. However, Commons is a bit more complicated. They want their work to be free, both in the United States and in the country of origin. Now, this is a slide that might make your head spin a bit. Um, there's been no clear case law on how foreign freedom of panorama interacts with the United States copyright law. Now, I've been talking to a few copyright experts on Commons, and they presume that the United States would use its own freedom of panorama revisions regardless of location in the court case. So, in other words, if it's a picture of a building in, the, in Israel or anywhere else, they would always apply their own revisions of freedom of panorama, so, which in the US is buildings allowed, sculptures, artwork, no, uh, which is potentially good because if only, if only US law matters, then no need to worry about uh, countries without freedom of panorama. However, there is a slight problem. There is a possible scenario that under, in, under US law, sculptures and art will be stripped of their freedom panorama, which would cause a lot of trouble on commons potentially. However, there's no case law on this, and some would say for complex reasons it would never happen. Um, in commons on practice, um, the US needs to pass US copyright law is generally put aside on the country of origin is the focus of uh, enforcement. So this results in three categories of copyright status of images. Uh, the first is the red images, I call them. Those are copyrighted in the United States. Uh, for example, sculptures in the US. Um, Wikimedia Commons not allowed. Other projects not permitted at all, except if they're uploaded under fair use, which I'm not getting into. Um, there's, then there's the amber images, which are those stuck in the middle. Those are copyrighted in the country of origin. They're generally not in the United States. Uh, for example, buildings and sculptures in France. Now, they're not OK on Commons, again. However, on other projects, they, probably are, they are probably OK assuming you're allowed to upload those images locally. Uh, green images, they're the good ones. They're not copyrighted in the country of origin. At present, that would include uh, buildings in public places in Germany. Uh, on Wikipedia Commons, they're completely fine. They're the only category that's OK. While on other projects, again, they're OK. Now, there have been many issues with trying to enforce these freedom and panorama and other, and other copyright issues on Commons. Uh, problems that have occurred include, and summarise into five main ones, the first is disagreement on speedy deletion. The second is disagreement on interpretation. The third is inconsistency. Four is lack of past enforcement and the consequences that's having. And five is the impact on other projects. The first is disagreement on speedy deletion. Now, speedy deletion on commons is deletion by an administrator without any discussion whatsoever. Um, speedy deletion is not codified on commons. They, can, they call it a mellow project. It's very much down to admin discretion. And images are speedy deleted very quickly for saying, well, there's no freedom panorama in this country. Um, however, a template encouraging people to tag images as such was deleted on grounds it was too complicated. And a proposed criteria to codify the Commons speed deletion system um, had the one related to no freedom panorama removed again because it's too complicated. So on the whole, it's moving in the direction of um, saying no speed deletion on freedom panorama issues. However, there's no community-wide consensus yet on the issue and it's still very much all over the place on that issue. Second is discriminant interpretation of the law. Main causes of disagreement are reliance on translation. Often things are done in English on Commons, although it's a multilingual project and people demand translation. Of course, not all laws are in English. Um, 
The second one is often a need for interpretation. Laws are often very, very vague on how they're written. A good example here is Israel. Uh, the 2007 Freedom Panorama covers architectural work, sculptures, and applied arts. Now, the third one, applied art, is an issue because it's been argued that applied art in Hebrew has a wider meaning. Now, applied art is simply uh, taking common objects, say a teapot, and saying, well, that's artwork, rather than conventional art such as paintings and so on. So the consequence of saying, well, applied art has a wider meaning means as well 2D works such as paintings could also be covered by Freedom Panorama. So as a result, we have lots of disagreement on this. There's inclusion of 2D artworks is disputed on commons from, he, from Israel. Uh, there are essays on this by three uh, users, and it's got quite debated at times. However, uh, I haven't got time to go in them, unfortunately. Uh, the third problem is inconsistency with the inconsistency of application of, um, of the law in these countries. Uh, most individual images are discussed at uh, deletion requests, which is frequently backlogged. However, most requests are closed with little discussion, so it's very much down to admin decision. Uh, there are great inconsistencies on where to set the fragile originality and what passes as de minimis. Uh, this is greatly aggravated by lack of case law. Uh, to give you a good example, the United Arab Emirates, we'd really just have no idea where the threshold originality and where de minimis is for buildings, so uh, really it is just a guesswork. Is this picture of concrete copyrighted, or, is it, or does it need a complete building? Images of construction are a big contentious issue there. Um, and this makes deletion requests very inefficient uh, because, as a result, to, give you, to keep to the UAE example, many, many cases are closed about deletion. For example, I did a study and uh, out of some, out of some over about a year that were recorded, about 180 results in deletion, while 165 did not. So near 50% near failure rate is not very good there. Um, fourth issue is lack of past enforcement. Now, Commons was launched in September 2004. However, nothing on Freedom Panorama and that's rated issues uh, appeared until 2006. And even then, really, nothing really happened when it came to enforcement of architectural copyright and so on until another two years. So, really, it was four years, really, to do whatever you like. Um, a good example of this would be a user called Lover of Dubai. Um, uh, he, uh, he uploaded hundreds of images of buildings in Dubai from August 2007 to November 2008. Um, there was no usable FOP in the United Arab Emirates, as you know. However, there was no warnings, no enforcement of this until suddenly, in January 2006, the user, who had long since gone at this stage, suddenly found themselves facing hundreds and hundreds of deletion requests for their images. And that raises the question, is that fair? They spent years uploading loads of lovely images and they weren't told, sorry, we're going to delete them because they're copyrighted. It certainly doesn't, doesn't help with user recruitment, which is certainly on the minds of the Foundation at the moment. Um, problem finding is the impacts of other projects. Obviously, you delete lots of images from Commons, then they're gonna, there's going to be resulting consequences for other projects. Uh, Wikimedia projects have varying approaches to this. On the English Wikipedia, there's a lot of apparent confusion on this. For example, there's a template encouraging photographs to be uploaded as none free. Um, and it talks about country of origin and how that's necessary for an image to be okay on commons. Uh, however, that is wrong. And the template is frequently ignored anyway. People just upload them as free. Uh, the public domain policy is not clear that only United States copyright law matters locally. On a simple English Wikipedia, no image uploads are allowed. The idea behind this is to just put all free images on commons. But however, what do you do with, um, what do you do with the amber images that are only okay in the US? And the probably answer to that is the policy dates from 2006, which is, um, which is before these issues were really thought about. So, possible solution is no clear consensus on changes at the moment. Mind changes through evolution are likely. Radical changes have also been proposed, which I'm briefly going to cover one, and that's what I call it the ignoring it option. That would amend policy to only apply United States copyright law to images depicting architectural artwork, which would create an exemption from current Commons policy. Um, the simple grounds for this is that enforcement compromises the educational mission of the project. Uh, there are similar proposals at, at, uh, on Commons photographs on modern buildings, which hasn't really gone anywhere yet. There is some precedent for this. For example, personality rights. We don't bother that on Commons. Just put a template on there. However, that's not. It's independent of copyright, which is generally always ignored. Um, there's also the issue of photographic reproduction of public domain artwork is allowed if it. Uh, regardless of potential copyright in the source country. However, that's related to a specific legal case, and there's back Wikimedia Foundation backing, which this does not. There's also alternatives for a more selective process focusing on specific countries where the law is vague as well. So in conclusion, then, uh, the current project, I have to say, is not working well. 
Uh, I think greater consensus, better consistency is needed on Commons on how to approach this issue. And more attention is needed from other projects on how to implement them. Uh, I think it is perhaps worth saying, is it time to rethink the fundamental policy, copyright policies of Commons and how it fits with the other projects? Is it worth saying we need country revision as well? And I think I finally should end on one last question, is should the Wikimedia Foundation get more involved in this? Should they provide some opinions and advice? And I've just provided some attribution there. And I'm afraid we don't have time for questions, though. If you ask me personally, I'll deal with them for you. And thank you. I'm Jonathan from Israel. Before we start, I'll have to explain a bit about freedom of panorama in Israel. Well, around three years ago, we had this issue with one of the big malls in Tel Aviv, where a security guard came and said uh, to one of my friends, you can't take pictures of uh, this mall because of security issues. And then he told them, what security issues? He said, no, no, the building is copyrighted, so you can't take pictures of it. So uh, my friend Ido, uh, arranged a big event where people stood around that mall and just took pictures of it and tagged it and uploaded it to fr Flickr. And it got on TV, on, and on news all around it, and the, hopefully the mall owners learned. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today we'll discuss political narrative and copyright. Well, one thing you have to understand about Israel, this fragile little state, is that um, our copyright regime is still crystallizing. We just um, turned our own copyright law a few years ago, and we're not still certain about what is fair use and what is, what is educational use, commercial use, and anything. So two weeks ago, there was a discussion in Parliament about two different issues. The, one, uh, the first is dig digitizing school books taking your course books from high school, preschool, whatever, and making digital copies of them so people will have better access. And the other one was to reform copyright on school books. And in this discussion, one parliament member, Anastasia Mikhaili, said, um, as, as opposition to, the, uh, to reversing and g going digital, she said, look at the propaganda that Israeli Arabs know how to do. They'll tap into the protocol of school books. They'll rewrite the history of the state of Israel. Wake up. There will be plenty of hackers that will install their own school books. And this is a parliament member. So uh, before we go on and ask whether copyright is political, is it narrative, or is it just funny, I, I want to discuss fair use because most of the people here don't know what fair use is. People have this gut feeling, right? You, you see something and you say, well, it's fair because it's this guy on YouTube, he plays the guitar, he teaches people how to play Led Zeppelin, but you're not sure whether it's fair or not. And then one day YouTube sends him an email and tells him, well, dude, uh, we had to remove your v video because of a copyright claim from Universal Music. Uh, or, you know, uh, this wedding photo or wedding uh, song that people upload and then because the, you hear five seconds of Prince in the background, it gets taken down and then the EFF takes Universal to court and loses. Anyone heard of uh, Lens versus Universal? Well, these cases occur. That's why I want to take a moment and devote it to my favorite TV show, South Park. South Park, which people, most people have heard about, is like 15th season now, uh, is one of the most popular and funny TV shows ever. And uh, the creators, Matt and Trey, uh, were interviewed five years ago to Reason, uh, the um, libertarian magazine in the United States, and said why they like um, people so much and they said well basically we don't care that people download our content from the web because we want to reach a wider audience so 
You see that content creators nowadays have this approach, even though they make millions from Viacom, the same company that is currently suing YouTube for $1 billion, people want their work to be acknowledged. That's also a part of the research I did last year for Consumers International. We interviewed uh, 300 content creators and we found that people want others to use their content. They want people to go and transform it and go and use it. That's why they created a website called South Park Studios. One of the biggest TV shows on a big TV network provides for the entire world, all the episodes of all the shows for free, and you can remix it there and you can use it. Around uh, three years ago, they decided to uh, start their satire, um, the sound. Sound doesn't work here. Uh, they decided to mock viral videos. I don't know if you've heard of Samwell. Samuel's video um, was one of the YouTube hits which South Park decided to mock. They went up and created an episode uh, depicting how Butters, one of their characters, uh, decides to upload a YouTube video and gets a lot of internet money. Well, Samuel, the creator, really didn't like it. So he went and sued South Park. And South Park went ahead and said, well, this is obviously fair use. We took your music. We wanted to mock the viral videos phenomena. And we took no more than 25 seconds from your song, uploaded it, covered it. Uh, this is not something that's subject matter to copyright. And he said, well, no, it is. This is my work. I wrote it. I have the rights for it. And you." You used it on TV, you made a lot of money on it, and I'm just this internet guy with 22 billion views on YouTube where people uh, saw me and liked me, but I didn't make money off the internet, so here's my chance. Uh, the court tossed it and dismissed the motion, uh, dismissed the lawsuit for uh, when it acknowledged fair use as a as a, uh, affirmative defense. Actually, the court said, well, fair use is mostly for uh, educational purposes, review, but also when you want to make an hom a homage, when you want to credit someone, when you want to say, I liked your work, and make a different version of it, you may do so. In Israel, we didn't have that much luck in Geva. Geva was a case where a cartoon artist um, used uh, Donald Duck's uh, image in order to create an Israeli version and mock the Israeli society. But uh, the Supreme Court said, well, if you're not mocking Donald Duck, it's not fair use. So uh, y you're not entitled for protection. <laughs> so um, there's this place where you're not sure what is fair use. The Israeli courts nowadays tend to acknowledge some uses that weren't actually uh, detailed in the law or listed as fair. Now more and more is fair, but it's lower court decisions. It's nothing that went up to the Supreme Court. Actually, we did have a ruling uh, a few weeks ago about personal copying, where, where the court said, where people download, it, it said it in Arbitral, not in something that would be case law later on, but he, he said, well, this uh, isn't fair use, but if people would have downloaded it for their own use at home, it might be fair use. It was. Uh, uh, a case that's irrelevant here, so uh, due to lack of time, I'll just move on. So, music, please. You ruined my surprise. And everyone knows Rick Astley, and uh, never gonna give you up, of course. Um, Rick Astley, people know him, had a big, huge hit in the 80s, but then he went astray. No one saw him later. So then came the internet and tried to save his career because people used this video in order to send their friends to, to watch it. He just wrote something like, well, I saw this amazing video of a kid on YouTube. You have to click it. And then people click it and saw Rick Astley. Uh, the phenomenon is called uh, Rick Rolling. I'm sure you've all been a victim to it. So 
Rick Astley uh, started to make his own money from YouTube now because um, people watch this video and click on the, um, the advertisements and everything's great. But Rick is just a phenomenon. You have to look at what's going around Rickroll, and that's tons of homages. People used Rickroll as a phenomenon. Family Guy uh, used it in one moment where people were surprised to see Rick Astley's music. But not only them, also in science. Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down, never gonna run around and desert you, never gonna make you This is Stephen Hawking, people. Never gonna tell a lie and hurt you. But, but you can find Rick Roll anywhere in popular culture. The actual song became a part of the internet culture, like other memes such as um, all your bass are belong to us, if you've heard of them, or other things. Think of your, your culture, your memories, everything around you. All of these things have become a part of you, and copyright law prevents you from using them now on, from now on because you have these restrictions. That's the problem with copyright, and that's why we need cultural rights in order to protect our culture. So acknowledging this culture no problem. Acknowledging this culture, um, we move on to government works. Uh, government works are usually exempt from copyright. In most normal states, unlike Israel, any work created by the government is not subject for copyright. Uh, the reason for it is, well, usually you don't earn money if you're a government. There's no profit of sales because you want to disseminate information. You want to send it to people. But this is Israel, you know. So the government press office has lots and lots of stock photography, photos from historical events that people aren't able to use without licensing them. So here, here comes Meir Shitrit. You all seen him, uh, you all saw him this morning. He's uh, the chair of the science committee, and he sat with Wikipedia and introduced the Wikipedia bill, which is allowing non-commercial use of government photos, only for photos and only for non-commercial uses. The problem is, well, you don't know exactly what is non-commercial, and it only applies for on photos. For example, when a friend of mine, uh, but this wasn't passed into law yet, but think that it might be, for a second, a friend of mine wanted to use statistical information from the Central Bureau of Statistics. And they told him, well, our reports are subject to copyright. We won't let you have them. Um, so the government said, no. Why not, you ask? Well, why not? Why not use these works? Uh, well, anti-Zionists may use it. Uh, this seems funny uh, if we go back to what Parliament member Michaeli said, because, well, if I'm a terrorist organization or if I'm anti-Zionist and I don't come, I don't visit Israel and I don't care, why should I care about Israeli copyright law? I mean, well, I'm the Hezbollah. I, I, I bomb Israel. I, I plan terror attacks, and then I'll say, well. I won't take this photo from the Knesset website because I might be sued for copyright infringement. Yeah, so this was the rationale behind <laughs> people. This was the rationale behind limiting use of government works. Okay, so let's see the problem here. The problem is that Copyright here is a political discourse. It's not something that has the economical value. And you have to remember, copyright has, in, it, it came because of incentives. We wanted to give incentives to authors to create by providing them the monopoly on their work and giving them money. They are the ones earning money, but the government well, it doesn't earn money. There's no encouragement of authorship because the press office will still continue to take photos because it doesn't sell them. It gives them, licenses them to press offices around the world. It wants to share this information. But no, anti-Zionists will use it. So 
the Israeli narrative was something more important in copyright than money. People decided that they need to have their narrative and not allow use of government works solely because of it. People, this is the problem, and it's, Israel is a case study here. So wh what I offer in a solution, which might be an option, is the Israeli-friendly license, meaning, well, let's le leave aside the Hezbollah and the Hamas and all these organizations. Let's draft a license. It's truly an open source on, on software because it's cause-oriented. But it says, well, if you're a non-commercial entity and you want to use our information, no problem as long as you adhere to the Israeli narrative and use it only in a, a way that will not um, deprive Israel of its right for self-existence. Well, using this license as a solution might help Israel detach itself from the narrative um, excuse to prevent uh, uh, government copyright over uh, government works. It's not a good solution, of course, because the good solution would be detach itself entirely from uh, copyright on government works, but it's uh, something that might help it keep its dignity. Um, well, that's it. Thanks. Good afternoon. So uh, after these two interesting talks, I hope uh, the third mine would be also interesting to you. Uh, I have been introduced, so we can start right now. Um, yeah, let me just say a few words about what this talk will be about. It's uh, the protection of intellectual property is an idea that was not existent before the 14th century. But uh, from this time on, this concept of intellectual property was developed further and further. Later on, because of economic reasons, mostly, intellectual property was introduced into the international law. And with the TRIPS agreement from the 90s, we got a very striking pact for the protection of intellectual property rights. The driving force between, behind these efforts to harmonize the international intellectual property law were the industrialized Western countries. So this is my first point. I want to show, give you a short overview about the history of intellectual property rights. Second, in contrast to this development, the developing countries were very skeptical, if not to say opposed to this evolution. And so I want you to show you, I want to show you the situation of the de developing countries. And uh, yeah, that's my second point. And as my third point, I want you to show a phenomenon that happened 2004. Uh, and it happened that the developing countries could achieve some improvements in the international intellectual property law. They could success, get some bargaining success and uh, change the important treaty. And I want, you, I want to show you how they could have done this, how could they change the treaty and then I want you to show how we could use this knowledge to change copyright law, international copyright law, in our sense. I hope it's not too much, but uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, very short, a few words. 
What is intellectual property? What is intellectual property? Uh, it's very important to know this for the talk. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not a special intellectual achievement. Yeah? It's, uh, rather, it means that the ob object of protection is immaterial. Yeah? That is important to know. And uh, intellectual property covers things like copyright, what is mostly the topic of this, but it also covers patent law, trademark protection, protection of trade secrets, and a lot of other things. But the, the combining thing is that all of these things are immaterial. So they can be texts, ideas, uh, yeah, solutions, everything. But if it's immaterial, then why it's called property, you may ask. This sounds a bit strange. Yes. But there are some commonalities with real property, but they are very little. And you, you have to know that you, can't, you, yeah, you cannot deprive someone of its uh, intellectual property, and you can copy intellectual property without any reproduction costs, nearly any. So it's very different from the real property, and uh, yeah, that is also something you, might, you can think about, why it's called property. But let's start with the history part. The title of this part is The Short History of IPRs. And it's not only called The Short History because I want to take this part very short. It's also called The Short History because, uh, because the intellectual property rights do not exist since the early years of mankind. They exist maybe since the 14th century or something like this. We will see it later. So they are relatively new to compared to other rights of, of the human mankind. As I said, uh, the first immaterial rights we can uh, find in the 14th century that are patents given by British landlords. They uh, assured the right to a privileged activity in a special economic discipline for 14 years. The idea behind this was to recruit foreign specialists uh, into the country. These experts should enrich the domestic economy to innovations. So it's not really what we understand under patents. So some yeah, patents in our understanding exist only since the 16th century. But in, in the 15th century, we can find the beginnings of a copyright system. And uh, it, in this time, the term described the privilege of a printer to print a certain book, mostly for economic reasons but also sometimes it was used as a tool for censorship, which is also interesting uh, thing. And uh, all the other rights were created in the 18th century. So as you can see, intellectual property is a, re really, yeah, a really new, I would say, invention, or you could say construction, and uh, there. In the, in the 19th century, we had uh, these intellectual property laws in some countries, mostly Europe, European countries. But um, what is important to know, most of these rights did not apply for, for agent people. So that led to the situation that in some places we could see a really brisk reprint market. They reprinted only the books are for Asian people, but because the countries were so small, for example, Germany was divided in a, in a lot of small parts at this time, so they had a lot of for Asian books to reprint, and it was a big market. And some people go so far that they say, this crazy lack of intellectual property, property rights was a significant factor of the developing 
of the 18th century rural Germany or other countries to an to a industrialized country and uh, also to a leading nation in science. It, they say that this was yeah, the significant factor. You can read more about this in a book from the last year by Eckhart Hoeffer, which you can find in my references. And I really recommend this to you, but I feel that it's only available in German so far. So maybe it's not for everybody of you. But there are other books in English as well. So, um, yeah, we, we are in the 19th century. And more and more states came up with the idea that strong intellectual property rights are really, really necessary to push their, their domestic economy. Yeah, and note we are in the 19th century, very late. They come up with this idea, and uh, they, they are first attempts of multilateral conventions between the states to prevent this problem of for Asian works. And in the next 40 years, there were made more than 100 treaties, more than 100 treaties between different countries about intellectual property rights. And this was the beginning of the internationalization of intellectual property rights. Here you can see two important conventions. One, you have heard of in Chris Tor, the Bern Convention. And uh, here both were created after the Paris World Exhibition in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, where where a lot of congresses of writers, artists, businessmen, and others, they started with the idea that they have to separate the intellectual property agreements from the existing trade law. And uh, th that was the idea. And both uh, conventions were created. And now they are in the world intellectual property. They are part of it. But, um, at this time, later on, we, we got a new treaty, the General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs. And uh, with this agreement, a lot of things changed. Um, first thing that changed was that intellectual property and trade law are now more combined. So we can see a significant change in the argumentation in the 80s in when a US spokesman said that trade distortions arising from different levels of intellectual property protection will, uh, yeah, will not be good for their trade. And so this was the beginning. Arising from the gut, um, from the nego negotiations, um, we got the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, in short called the TRIPS. And um, this was the, is, it was established at the end of the Uruguay round, and uh, it was part of the former GATT. And this TRIPS should give effective action against any act of enfrightment of intellectual property rights. But what's about the developing countries? So these countries, they could achieve some exceptions from the intellectual property rights for AIDS generics and uh, yeah, mostly for generics. But then when Brazil, South, America, uh, South Africa, and the Thai government, when they tried to prevent the initiating HIV pandemic, the US threatened with punishments in trade relations. So these exceptions were useless, de facto. Because of this, in the following round of the 
negotiations, uh, the developing countries tried to make changes to the agreement and they could finally achieve some improvements for themselves. So, if we have to think of the situation of developing countries, we have to answer this question. Are strong intellectual property rights good for development? Are they good for research? Are they useful? And a lot of people say yes. For example, like the OECD economists, and uh, yeah, from one I have this quote, he says, uh, stronger IPRs, intellectual property rights, are associated positively with trade, foreign direct investment and licensing in developing countries. So we have these people, but in, in contrast, we have other people like uh, the economic Richard who says, the true casual relationship between IPRs and such performance vari variables may actually run in the reverse direction. So he says that history would teach us that strong IPRs are only positively at the stage of a well-developed economy. And when you establish these intellectual property rights before this special stage, then it would restrain the developing. But yeah, so we have two different opinions, then we should have a look at the empirical research and there's an interesting meta study and the authors resume that they don't, they say we have to notice that a series of significant, uh, of scientific studies have found whack or no evidence that intellectual property increases innovation. So the case against intellectual property rights is decisive. So what does it mean now for us? We can resume. If strong prop intellectual property rights are positive in general, it's still a hot debate. But this doesn't matter for us. But following the empirical studies, we can say that for developing countries, and only for developing countries, high intellectual property rights bring more dis disadvantages than advantages. And following to this idea, we, we can ask two questions. The first question is how, uh, w yeah, when it's not good for them, when it restrains the development, why, why did they agree to this treaty? Yeah? And the second question is, uh, uh, as I said, they could, ch uh, they could make changes to the agreement later on, and how, they could, how could they achieve to make these changes? First question, to answer it, why did they agree? It's easy to say, it's a lack of power. They lack the negotiation power to prevent the trips relative to the well-organized developed countries who insisted on the agreement. And this is just, the, this lack of negotiation power is because of the smaller markets. Why is that? Why that? To, to make high profits, you need access to big markets. So most of the developing countries have small markets and uh, they are dependent from the other markets. So in our case, that led to the following situation at the Uruguay round, the round where the trips was negotiated. The industrialized countries with big market power, the US, the European communities, Canada and Japan, on the one hand, and uh, they could plausibly argue that they would abort all the negotiations 
if the developing countries would not sign the TRIPS. So that is why they had to sign it. But the more interesting question, how could they achieve the uh, changes to the agreement later? To answer these questions, we first have to look at the actors. And we can divide them in three transnational networks. The first network, the first network is the international pharmaceutical companies plus the governments of the court, these governments I've mentioned, the US, the European communities and so on. So, and uh, the second transnational network is the so-called Intellectual Property Committee, the IPC, which is a group of 13 really, really big US companies like HP, like IBM, Monsanto, Pfizer, and so on. And those both groups were fighting for a harder and yeah, for the uh, TRIPS uh, agreement. And their rivals who were against the agreement formed in the so-called AIDS, AIDS network. And this includes the African group countries who were massive affected by AIDS and all newly industrialized countries like India and Brazil. Okay, what happened? The IPC, this group of companies, they influenced the agenda setting. They influenced the US government and they influenced the European Commission as you can read in the European Commission's green paper, it's nearly the same words like in their precision papers. That's the first thing. What happened second is that we have to think of the framing effect. Framing, as to think a well-known encyclopedia, is an inevitable process of selective influence over the individual's perception of the meanings attributed to words or phrases. That means it's more than agenda setting, it's about strongly suggesting your procedures to the political theater. And uh, yeah, so what did the AIDS network do? They informed the public, they, they, yeah, what did the AIDS network do after this happened? They informed the public about the problems. They told them that a strong patent law will forbid them to, to create these generics, which will cause in many deaths. And so they created a public pressure. And this pressure finally brought the government of the court to concede. And as a third point, the developing countries strongly stick together and they cooperate, cooperated. And yeah, uh, our fourth point, what can we learn from it? Just according to these explanations I gave you, uh, I formulated three goals for the next years for us. The first point, according to my last point, uh, we must seek alias. We, we must uh, coordinate with other NGOs, with governments who are also against stronger intellectual property protection and so on. Second, we must become an important ag agenda setter. We need to lobby at the international level, at the WTO, at the European Union, all these institutions. And uh, as a third point, and maybe the most complicated to achieve, we need to reframe the public opinion of free knowledge and copyright. We have to change it from an unimportant topic for specialists to a topic that affects every one of us or everyone who uses the internet, which is nearly everyone. And we, we should make this transformation of the world and we should achieve that the topic of copyright will be discussed in the very public sphere. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, if you need further reading, I have attached my, my references in the 
slides are online. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ryan Kaldari. I'm going to be talking briefly about the public domain um, with mostly US-centric focus, because that's where I'm from. Um, uh, I don't have any slides and, um, or any official presentation, because um, my original proposal was just to do a uh, panel discussion, but apparently we're not doing panel discussion. So I'm just going to do a really informal talk. So I hope that's OK. Um, let's see. Well, as you all are very aware, uh, the public domain is extremely important to Wikipedia, uh, and it's also very important to many of the sister projects. Um, we, the Wikimedia movement uh, is, well, well the, the sites that we have, the projects that we have, are one of the uh, biggest hosts of public domain material in the world. And not only that, we're also uh, one of the biggest reusers of public domain material in the world. Um, on Wikimedia Commons, um, for example, we have three million public domain files, um, which constitutes about a third of the material that we host there. Um, uh, these files are used for a lot of different things, obviously for um, illustrating Wikipedia articles. Several hundred thousand Wikipedia articles are illustrated with public domain files. Um, and then uh, other uses include uh, proofreading text for Wikisource, um, and obviously reusing these files for uh, lots of uses outside of other Wikimedia projects, like in books and papers and magazines and you know, all sorts of things that, all sorts of uses that people have come up with. Um, and in, in the process of uh, building this archive and using all of this material, um, we have built up a community that cares very deeply about the public domain. Um, and as far as I'm aware, in the history of copyright, um, this is pretty unique. Like, there hasn't really been a group of people before who are very dedicated to um, protecting the value of the public domain and appreciating it. Um, because as um, we learned in the uh, presentation this morning, um, we've mostly historically been taught to value commodification uh, and monetization over sharing uh, and altruism. Um, and so traditionally, those, uh, the commodification and monetization have been the only incentives to create that the law has considered important. Um, and so because of this, most governments have gradually placed more and more uh, emphasis and importance on intellectual property and less importance on the public domain. Um, and so this has led to things like 95-year uh, copyright terms in the United States um, and the patenting of crustless peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, this is very different from how things were um, a few hundred years ago and even 50 years ago. Um, and just to give you kind of an example of like how dramatically um, our attitudes about intellectual property have changed, um, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read um, a quotation from Thomas Jefferson. Um, and the book that I'm actually reading this quotation from is uh, the book The Public Domain by James Boyle, which I just want to plug real quick because this is a really great book and I, all of you guys should read it if you can. Um, so this is Thomas Jefferson um, in a letter that he wrote. Um, if nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of, of exclusive property, it is the, action of think of the, is the action of the thinking power called an idea, which an individual may exclusively possess as he keeps it to himself. But the moment it is divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone, and the receiver cannot dispossess himself of it. Its peculiar character, too, is that no one possesses the less because every other one possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. That ideas should freely spread from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man and improvement of his condition seems to have been peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature, 
when she made them, like fire, expansible over all space, without lessening their density in any point, and like the air in which we breathe, move, and have our physical being, incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation. Inventions, then, cannot in nature be a subject of property. So obviously this is extremely difficult, for, uh, extremely different from uh, most of the um, attitudes that we currently have in government and even in you know, the public discourse on IP. Um, let's see. Um, and so it, currently um, what we have instead is we have uh, media companies such as Disney, we have publishing companies, um, and a, a lot of the um, content holders um, who are lobbying the government to push for uh, more expansive IP laws. And then we even now have the situation where we have governments lobbying each other on behalf of these companies. Um, as one example, uh, in 1996, uh, the US Congress uh, enacted the URAA, um, which is was basically um, uh, part of uh, an extension of the, the Berne Agreement, which is basically uh, re-copywriting um, public domain files that had, from uh, foreign works that had fallen into the public domain in the US. Um, and so you, you had things like uh, the writings of Mahatma Gandhi, you had uh, the paintings of Paul Klee, you have um, you know, the, the writings of Leon Trotsky, um, you know, actually there are probably millions of works that this affected in the U.S. Um, they were all put back under copyright protection, even though they had been public domain. Um, and so obviously this created a problem because people were using these because they were in the public domain and they were um, objected to the fact that, you know, they were, they were already using them in, for instance, university courses or in uh, books or media that they were publishing and then they couldn't do this anymore without paying licensing. Um, so this led to a court case um, which you may have heard of re uh, recently um, called Golan versus Holder, which is actually going to be decided by the Supreme Court um, probably within the next year. Um, and um, one thing that is really great is that the Wikimedia Foundation has filed an amicus brief in this case, um, along with the Internet Archive and the American Library Association and some other organizations, um, to say that the public domain is actually important and we care about it. And um, in this instance, this is actually the first instance in the US where public domain works have ever been recopyrighted. Um, and so this is a very important case because um, it could set precedent and allow uh, um, media companies and other companies to, to lobby for recopywriting more public domain works. Um, and so I, th I think the fact that um, we're being proactive in this is very important. Um, and I think that going forward, because we now have this community, we have all of these people across the world who are interested in this issue, um, we really do have the power to affect change. And I think that uh, we need to um, take advantage of that and actually uh, utilize that going forward um, because historically there hasn't there hasn't been a counterbalancing force um, to raise these issues and so like for instance uh, also in the US in uh, 1998 was the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act which um, extended copyright terms uh, to 95 years um, and this was before Wikipedia existed so there was no community to stand up and say you know this this is actually hurting the public this is not helping anyone this isn't creating um, compelling incentives for people to create. It's actually hindering people from being able to utilize their own culture to create new works. Um, and so, as many of the other speakers have said, I think it's, it's very important that we um, organize and stay proactive and come up with ideas about um, how we can respond to future threats to the public domain. Um, and I guess that's it, so thanks. So if people want to ask one, you know, one of the panelists, and I'll ask you to come over here. Can we get light of the, and to see the audience? Because I, I don't see any hands. Please.
No, you have to come here. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, so the question was, uh, we heard about uh, you know, some of the threats to the public domain. How do we go about coping with it, right? Uh, what do we do about it? Um, my solution, which is uh, kind of strange saying it, as I, I am a lawyer, uh, I'd recommend hacktivism. Not the illegal part of hacktivism, but the actual cool part of hacktivism, which is, for example, stretching fair use to the boundaries. And uh, if you want to show the government that um, you want government works in the public domain, then take the government photos and use them in the furthest uh, use of fair use by using gov uh, government works in your works as fair use. Find out where you can use them and use them in technological means. Use cre and uh, create cool tools that people will use and then tell them, well, you see this and this and this, this is illegal. Um, I teach computer game development law. My uh, students are actually computer science students, not law students, and I give them a course about what's legal and what's not. Um, the, uh, their final uh, uh, essay or final work has to be to design something that breaks the law, because I can, because I have the academic freedom to let them in a submitted coursework to show what violates copyright law. So they can, for example, take Pac-Man and infringe on its rights. But if you do it under the fair use umbrella, then you might be able to give a solution that people will enjoy and understand what to change. We have another commenter. Yeah. So the, the aim of my talk was to give you this answer. And I've, I've noticed that the last part was too short and the, the first part was very much too long. So, but what I wanted to say, that the, what we can do is that we can try to reframe the topic. We have to change public opinion and make this, uh, yeah, make people understand that it's a topic that affects everyone. And uh, so, yeah, only, I think that's the only way how, how we could uh, make changes. Because uh, our governments will only listen to, to a big mass and to, to a, a public opinion. So uh, these were uh, responses from lawyers saying be an activist, but we've heard Ryan also mentioning uh, some of the uh, lawsuits that are brought against like, challenging some of the laws in court. Uh, but I think that a lot of the lobbying is actually becoming very successful. Uh, my proposal was to try to put all of this under one umbrella. And I think public domain is too abstract for people, so you, if we say, we all care about the public domain. We all care about the environment. People you know, that are not working in editing uh, uh, Wikipedia don't really get it. But if you talk about rights, that's something everyone understands, right? They want to know what rights do they have, right? They consume music. They want to know what they can do and cannot do with that. So I think that could be a framework that uh, maybe could mobilize. But I think other frameworks are also Good, and we can use all of them. Another question. Um, so good afternoon to everyone. I'm Josh Levy from the Philippines, and my question goes to the entire panel. Since I am from a developing country, I'd like to know, like, um, in the Philippines, we have a very, uh, very peculiar copyright situation. Our fact, we have a fair use provision which is entirely identical to the U.S. fair use provision, but the interpretation is very different. On Wikipedia, what happens is, unfortunately, because most of the fair use people that analyze the use of fair use are American, use the U.S. fair use provision, what happens is the freer Philippine fair use provision, unfortunately, gets snubbed in favor of the U.S. provision. Mm -hmm. So we run into problems with that. On the other hand, we also have a very peculiar copyright regime, because, for example, for works of the government, officially, 
works of the Philippine government are in the public domain. It's clearly said there, no work of the government of the Philippines shall have copyright. But, unfortunately, they require for example, they need permission if you intend to use the work for profit. So essentially, it's a public domain, non-commercial license, which I presume exists nowhere else in the world. And so, for chapters like us, especially in the developing world, it's extremely hard to convince our governments to try to convince them to change copyright laws because they feel that, number one, perhaps there is a benefit, for example, for governments to benefit from their works, which in this case, the Philippine government officially, under the laws of the Republic of the Philippines, has a right to demand royalties for copyright further government works because they want to profit off of it. Of course, we're a poor country, our government has no money, therefore the government can use the money off their works. The second thing there is that I don't think they have an incentive for changing copyright laws because they feel that it is something that is not high on their priorities. You know, for chapters in the developing world, it's hard to convince a government to change copyright law when you know you have issues that, you know, government can easily focus on issues like hunger or education or healthcare, but they don't want to focus on changing copyright laws because it's something that's trivial. So, we, um, I think it may not be the right question, but I hope that probably you can use advice on how to proceed with changing our copyright regimes. Because in developing countries, a lot of developing countries do not have these types of provisions. I can think there are only a handful of countries probably which even have freedom of panorama provisions in developing countries. And the Philippines, according to Commons of Michigan, is certainly not one of them. Or the public domain can certainly use reinforcement, but you know, it's also very difficult to do so. So what can you advise us in developing countries on how to proceed with changing our copyright? Um, well, I invite all of the panelists to respond to that, but in the meantime, before we have other volunteers, I will just say on the three points that you mentioned. Uh, first of all, on fair use, um, it's actually interesting because uh, the only countries in the world that have these fair use exemptions are the U.S., the Philippines, and Israel. So now once we enacted a fair use exemption from 2007, you can start to use our own presidents, which are actually uh, better and more liberal on the fair use interpretation so far. So maybe the more countries that would adopt the fair use regime, you know, the, then uh, the fair use itself is going to change its meaning. Um, on governmental works, um, I think that's, that's a very interesting point. I'm not sure I understand that I fully understood this example, but if there, are, there is no copyright on governmental works, but the government still charge for it, there are lots of activism that could be done, and actually one example comes from the United States, from uh, the group that is led by Ed Felton at Princeton, that developed, for instance, um, a system that would allow the use of public domain work that are Kate court cases, like uh, opinions that are uh, being extracted by some of the users and being deposited in an, an alternative um, archive and being and be and made accessible for free to the general public. This is not a copyright infringement, and it, it circumvents the system of the government of charging a price for that service of providing. In terms of changing the regime in developing countries, I think developing countries can actually play a key role. And the reason is that uh, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, that used to be a very conservative player in the uh, arena of copyright, is now endorsing uh, what is called the developing agenda and a lot of reforms that uh, are actually moved forward by organizations such as Creative Commons. And I think that due to some political changes within that organization, uh, developing countries can actually use their power in that organization in order to force some of the reforms that are needed, not only in developing countries, but also in developed countries. So I think that is a way to go about that. We can take one more question. Yes, please.
many, it's not as, uh, I mean, there are not too many conflicting interests as in the corporate. So okay, we were able to create a huge coalition for a different organization, even uh, also business, which helped us celebrate the public domain. And um, also, it was very easy to translate the public domain idea, uh, basically because of the general welfare to talk about it. Right. Yeah, I think these are all uh, excellent ideas. And I think actually celebrating the Public Domain Day, and I think it is celebrated, it is also celebrated in Israel, but uh, around the world. And I think uh, it's actually another example of how, do, by doing, by providing a working example of what it is, you can actually make it real for a lot of people for which public domain was just a legal concept that was mirroring copyright. They didn't know what copyright was. so copy public domain or comments did not make a lot of sense. And I think that a lot of uh, these abstract legal concepts could actually be uh, made more uh, accessible to people just by using them right, and making them act upon them. A last question was here. Yeah. So my question to the panel is that uh, given that um, large content companies have been buying their own legislation for increasing copyright of Anyone want to respond to that? You want to? It's a, a kind of shameless plug into this space. Right. I all I invite you all to my talk tomorrow about lobbying and changing copyrights. So it will be a direct um, succession to this conversation. And I would love to hear your thoughts once you are already initialized um, to, the, to the issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I was just going to respond to the uh, question about uh, the influencing legislation really quick. Um, because of the specific nonprofit status and the restrictions that uh, go along with that uh, in the US on the foundation, uh, the foundation is limited in um, what they can do that would be considered political activity. Um, obviously, like there are um, indirect things that we could do to influence legislation um, by doing activism and things like that. Um, but as far as uh, doing any direct lobbying or things like that, um, there are a lot of restrictions that would prevent us from doing that. Uh, there may, however, not be as many restrictions on other chapters depending on what status um, their organizations have in their respective countries, though. Thank you. On this happy note, uh, please join me in thanking the, our panelists. We have to close this